Great. So um, my name's Slade, and uh, I'm a partner in the law firm of Whitliff Cutter. Uh, I'm a digital uh, media lawyer. I focus on uh, providing strategic legal advice and services uh, to a wide group of uh, companies doing business online, um, mobile and, and desktop and basically everything. Uh, but uh, typically, my clients are in the ad marketing uh, uh, and ad tech space, or I'm sorry, uh, ad tech and marketing tech spaces. Um, I'm a, a certified uh, privacy professional um, with the International Association of, of uh, Privacy Professionals. Uh, and most of my uh, professional experience has been in handling um, legal, uh, contractual, uh, regulatory compliance issues for uh, companies, uh, digital marketing companies, lead gen companies, affiliate marketing, uh, mobile marketing, obviously, and uh, ad networks uh, is also a big part of my, my uh, um, area. So, like I said, I've got a, a lot to talk about. Um, I'm going to condense it down and leave a little bit extra room because I think I only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to leave a little extra room at the end so we can have a, a more informal question and answer at the end. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about avoiding legal risk in the, uh, in the world of mobile marketing, in the ever-evolving world of mobile marketing. Uh, and uh, when I use the term legal risk, I'm, I'm really talking about uh, both from a uh, regulatory perspective and from a contractual perspective, and they, they tie together uh, as, as, as we'll discuss. Um, uh, now, uh, a lot of the, the principles of risk mitigation that apply in, uh, in, in the desktop world, uh, in the, the normal online world, uh, uh, apply with equal force to mobile. Um, and so I'm not going to really be talking about those things because, you know, A, I only have 30 minutes, um, and, and B, those are pretty widely known and understood. Uh, but uh, what I want to focus on are some of the kind of more idiosyncratic and specific uh, issues that relate uh, to sp specifically to people who want to mobile uh, sorry uh, monetize mobile uh, traffic or buy uh, mobile media. Okay. Um, so if you were in the last presentation, uh, I don't know. Did you guys happen to catch the last one? Well, okay. Then I'll, I will definitely go over this next part because. Uh, uh, he did a great job of, of talking about uh, the mobile ecosystem, uh, the mobile marketing ecosystem. Uh, but just so that we're kind of on the same page as far as what uh, the, the basic context, uh, context is for uh, my, my uh, talk, uh, I'm going to give you a real brief uh, high-level view of the, uh, of, of the mobile ecosystem, um, mobile marketing ecosystem. Um, so uh, I think the, the easiest way to understand this area is just by traffic type, right? Uh, and I'm just going to be super simple about it. Um, there's, there's three basic marketing channels uh, in, in mobile. Uh, the first one is just the mobile web, and that's very much analogous to just mo uh, websites on mobile, right? So that's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, the next channel uh, that, that I'm, that I'm uh, touching on here is uh, in-app, uh, and, and that is... Um, uh, display, push notifications, hosted forms, uh, virtual currency, uh, native ads, and so forth uh, that actually are uh, presented within the mobile application itself. Um, and then uh, finally, I would also include SMS text uh, marketing in, in, in terms of uh, mobile, uh, the, the mobile ecosystem. Now, this is a little bit of a uh, uh, kind of... Uh, the redheaded stepchild of, of, uh, of mobile marketing to a certain extent because there is a lot of uh, risk uh, involved in this uh, due to some specific laws that, uh, that are on the books that have, that have been very actively litigated in, in recent years. Um, and, but at the same time, as, as we'll talk about, it's a, it's a very uh, powerful uh, marketing channel. Um, so, okay, so I will dive right into the, the risk mitigation uh, aspect here. And the first thing um, to be aware of is uh, the, 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 just the kind of the general regulatory landscape for mobile. <clears throat> uh, of course, we have uh, all of the familiar players, the FTC, FCC, uh, the state AGs, and so forth. Uh, these these uh, uh, agencies uh, have um, very uh, uh, stringent rules that apply to marketing in general, and they apply, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with equal force in the, in the mobile environment. Uh, but what's interesting about mobile is that it also uh, has a very, uh, there, there is a very kind of robust uh, uh, self-regulatory uh, regime that's, uh, that, that, that is quite uh, 
prominent in the mobile marketing industry, and, and one example uh, is the, the trade association called the Mobile, Market, the mobile Marketing Association. Uh, I was a member of this, uh, uh, the Consumer Best Practices Committee on this, uh, for this organization. I can, they, it's a, so they do a lot of good work. They're very, they, they have a lot of lawyers that, uh, that kind of inform the process. Uh, and so they produce a lot of guidelines and uh, uh, best practices that will help anybody that's trying to kind of enter the, the mobile market to do it in the, in the right way and to market things uh, in a way that doesn't create risk. So Mobile Marketing Association, another, another uh, uh, player is the CTIA. CTIA. Uh, they are roughly analogous to the MMA, perhaps a little bit more uh, a prominent organization. They focus a little bit more uh, on the technical side, uh, but the CTIA uh, also. Uh, it's kind of the 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 they they have the teeth in the in the in the um, mobile marketing ecosystem because they they actually uh, they also in collaboration with the mobile marketing association have these these specific best practices and rules uh, and they actually have uh, audit uh, teams that will make life very uncomfortable for marketers uh, if if you violate their their rules or they they have that potential anyway. Um, then the uh, Interactive Advertising Bureau has a, has a mobile component to it as well. The DAA, Digital Advertising Alliance, uh, focuses primarily on interest-based advertising. Uh, they're the folks who are responsible for the little blue uh, um, triangle, ad choices triangle that you'll see on interest-based advertising. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and then, of course, the carriers themselves are part of all of this, the, the whole process. They're, uh, they're members of the, all of these <laughs> organizations and they, to a very large extent, kind of dictate uh, what, the, what the best practices and, and guidelines are to be on these different, uh, 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 on, on, on their platform. So, um, the, so the, kind of the, the reason I start with um, this kind of alphabet soup of organizations is, uh, first of all, as I said, they, they really do produce some, uh, some good work product that can help you uh, very quickly understand what is and is not uh, a, a good practice in the mobile marketing environment. Um, but one of the things that, that's um, useful from a more strategic perspective is, you know, the, the whole concept of self-regulation is that you want to uh, avoid having uh, regulation imposed on you by governmental actors, right? So you want to you want to make sure that the that the industry that you're in is uh, kind of self-regulating, uh, so that it doesn't require uh, much nastier forms of uh, of of regulation from from reg uh, from governmental uh, actors. And so, what you can frequently kind of uh, distill from a lot of the work product from these uh, trade organizations is kind of where things are going. Uh, uh, from a more formal enforcement perspective, right? So you can see kind of what are the uh, hot button areas, uh, you know, one to two years down the road, and you can see the, how the industry is trying to kind of uh, regulate itself in those hot button areas, and it does provide, it, you can actually provide, uh, derive some valuable uh, business uh, intelligence from that kind of uh, analysis of the, of the work of these types of uh, organizations. Okay, so uh, if you were able to catch the, the speaker before me, he did a great job of kind of talking about uh, getting into a mobile mindset, right? So uh, from a marketing perspective, yes, the, the mobile mi mindset is absolutely imperative. You have to know that you're dealing with uh, a much different form factor. And by form factor, I'm really just talking about kind of the physical dimensions of, of, the, of the device and, and, and the way that people interact with those, that, that, that device. It's a, it's a very different environment than the, the, des the desktop environment. And that is relevant uh, uh, from a marketing perspective as, uh, as, as Dale was speaking to uh, in the previous presentation, but it is also quite relevant uh, from a compliance perspective. Um, and um, the, the, the FTC has made that uh, abundantly clear um, in 2013, they published, uh, or they published a, a update for their kind of famous, at least in my world, famous uh, document, uh, .com disclosures, uh, and um, it had been on the books for uh, 10 years and was woefully in need of updating. But um, in that document, uh, you'll find a lot of 
well, you'll find some useful uh, uh, marketing advice in there. But the big takeaway for mobile uh, from that document and from multiple other statements from the FTC is just that uh, that that the the form factor uh, is is a significant consideration, and it's the real the real takeaway is that mobile optimization is uh, is not optional, right? Um, you know, the, it's too damn small is not a defense, uh, according to the FTC. So your your disclosures, uh, whether they're pricing or or other kinds of uh, key uh, disclosures that have to be presented in the context of ad advertising copy. Uh, has to be optimized uh, for the mobile device. Um, presumably, uh, this isn't that much of a hardship, right? Because, I mean, all of the, the WordPress uh, uh, templates and, and uh, basically everybody is already optimizing for mobile because if you're not optimizing for mobile, as, as uh, the previous speaker would, would point out, then you're, you're not monetizing on mobile. So uh, especially uh, Google uh, has just, uh, they, they, everyone was calling it mobile geddon but back in April, they, they rolled out some new algorithms that basically penalize you for not having a mobile optimized uh, site. So that is relevant both from a marketing perspective and from a, a regulatory perspective. Uh, so uh, in, in, and furthermore, in the privacy context, it's, it's particular, particularly important. Uh, if you're doing anything with, uh, with uh, personal data, uh, uh, collecting or, or using personal data for marketing purposes, uh, those disclosures uh, have to be made in a clear and conspicuous way regardless of, of whether you're uh, in a mobile environment or a desktop environment. So just having a little link uh, at the bottom of your page probably isn't going to cut it if you're, if, you're, if you're collecting and using personal data for, for those types of purposes. Okay, actually, do I have time to talk at 3 o'clock? Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about native adver advertising. It's not up in my presentation but, uh, or in the deck, but um, uh, the form factor issue that I was just mentioning uh, ties into this uh, other kind of mobile ad strategy that's been gaining a lot of traction in recent years. It's called native advertising. Uh, now, the IAB describes native advertising as... Um, ads that are so cohesive with the page content assimilated into the design and consistent with the platform behavior that the viewer simply feels that they belong. So uh, in other words, um, it, it is, it, it's, it, it's their advertising copy that um, is just built into the native content and really uh, it, 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 it's kind of a seamlessly integrated into that content. Now, um, the, uh, the, it, it's a very powerful strategy, right, because it, uh, it can be both relevant and un unobtrusive, but uh, th there's a risk here that the ads are a little bit too native, right, um, meaning that they're not adequately differentiated from the native content. Um, I don't know if you guys are fans of John Oliver, I, but I am, and he has a great uh, bit. Uh, if I had time, I would show it to you. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, but he has a great bit on uh, native advertising. He just rants about it. Uh, in a very negative way, uh, but specifically in the news, uh, you know, uh, context where native advertising does get a little bit sketchy when it's influencing, like, what kind of news is being delivered and so forth. But it's a little more innocuous in the in the marketing context, and as I say, it can be quite uh, quite effective. Um, the IAB uh, and the FTC both have good guides uh, on how to do native advertising in a uh, in a in a uh, in a relatively risk-free way, uh, and they, the, those guidelines generally boil down to uh, using uh, graphical elements or uh, ideally uh, using um, a promoted by or a sponsored by type disclosure next to your ad unit so that even though it looks exactly like the, uh, you know, the native content, it's adequately differentiated and uh, reasonable users can see it and say, oh, okay, well, that's cool, it's, it's, it's someone uh, advertising a highly relevant thing that's relevant to the content. It's not, it's not, as, uh, uh, you know, it's not as sneaky as uh, some, some of the native advertising that has historically been out there. Um, a, uh, so I just want to make one quick plug. So a, a good network for uh, this native advertising uh, 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 strategy is, uh, is a client of mine, uh, they're out of, uh, San Francisco, they're a very large mobile advertising network uh, called Inmobi. Uh, they've been focusing on native uh, advertising for a couple of years now, and I actually have been able to kind of see the, uh, the nuts and bolts of how they put that together, and it's pretty impressive uh, how they try to really uh, differentiate without 
killing uh, the uh, the marketing uh, power of it. So uh, that's that's uh, that's one mobile ad network that I would recommend. Um, I don't know if if Leadbolt uh, does does uh, native as well, but I'm sure I'm sure that they're uh, they're equally proficient at it. Um, okay, now uh, moving on to uh, uh, SMS. Um, So the, the, the powerful yet perilous world of uh, SMS marketing. So we're all familiar with what SMS is. I mean, we do it every day, um, uh, text messaging. But uh, the, notewor the noteworthy thing about SMS uh, from an industry perspective uh, is that you know, it's, it's very old school and uh, not that exciting from a technological perspective. It's not, it doesn't have a lot of uh, glamor to it. Um, but we are con continuing to see it grow as a marketing channel. I mean, a lot. I mean, this is, this is a serious uh, way to market uh, products and services to, to users. And uh, you, you probably wonder, how can that possibly be? There's all these uh, internet-based messaging uh, applications like WhatsApp and uh, Viber and others that would seem to make uh, the whole SMS channel uh, less, less compelling. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really the diversity of these IP-based messaging apps is what makes uh, it, it, it's kind of a, a, from a brand perspective or from an advertiser perspective, it's a, a huge fragmentation headache, right? Because there's no easy way to kind of consolidate those, those areas and just market. You know, you have to, you have to break it down to this, this particular uh, service or that particular service. And so um, what SMS does is, uh, you know, out of the box, uh, you, you can market to, uh, Six, uh, the statistic in the last presentation was there were some, something like 6.8 billion uh, uh, mobile subscriptions in the world, which is kind of mind-blowing when you realize that there's 7 billion people in the world. But um, so, you know, out of the box, you can market via SMS to that, that kind of a volume of, of, uh, of, of user. Uh, and, and plus, SMS has just this insane uh, open rate, 98% uh, open rate. Uh, so SMS is definitely uh, here to stay. Um, but uh, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act is also here to stay, and it's something that you absolutely, uh, uh, unequivocally have to be familiar with if you're going to do any kind of SMS marketing. Now, uh, some of you may be familiar with that, uh, with, with this, uh, um, this um, statute, the TCPA, uh, because uh, it's specifically in the telemarketing context, right, because that's where it's really been having an enormous impact. Um, and people have been talking about it for the last couple of years. But um, it's also uh, quite relevant uh, in the SMS space uh, because uh, under the TCPA, uh, an SMS qualifies as a phone call, right? So uh, you have to comply with all of the consent requirements, uh, and they're quite rigid and uh, extensive uh, for, uh, for the TCPA in order to, uh, in order to, to uh, run SMS marketing campaigns that don't, uh, don't, that don't violate the, uh, the, the TCPA. Um, and so I will uh, quickly go over some of those requirements just uh, to give you a sense of what, uh, of what, of what the TCPA requires. Um, so if you send a, a, a user an SMS with any marketing content, and marketing content is broadly defined. If you're trying to sell anything, it's marketing. Uh, even if you're you know, trying to sell something and also providing pure information, it's still marketing. And so uh, you cannot send that uh, to an individual uh, handset uh, without first getting what uh, the FCC uh, calls uh, prior uh, express written consent. Okay, um, and, and, uh, and there are, like I said, very specific and very rigid requirements that you have to uh, uh, comply with in order to get that form of consent. Uh, you have to identify the specific company that, you, that con, uh, to whom consent is being provided. Uh, you have to identify the consumer's phone number. Uh, you have to have a clear and affirmative agreement from the user. I mean, I agree or I consent has to be in, in your consent language when you're collecting their phone number for marketing purposes. Uh, it's got to disclose that uh, the consumer is authorizing uh, the seller to engage in telemarketing. Uh, it's got to disclose that the calls will be made uh, using an automated technology. Uh, and that's actually, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's actually extremely important to have that automated uh, technology piece in there. And people are getting sued uh, a lot uh, for failing to disclose that they're uh, sending text messages via an auto dialer. Um, 
it uh, also has to disclo uh, disclose that the consumer is not required to provide consent as a condition of purchasing uh, whatever product they're, they're engaging on, uh, and it has to be memorialized in an, an electronic record. So it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff that has to, has to be included in the consent and has to meet those specific requirements. And the downside, if you fail to do that, is huge because uh, the, the, the penalties are $500 per violation, uh, $1,500 per willful violation. And if you're doing any kind of campaign of any kind of scale, I don't need to do the math for you. It gets pretty, pretty, pretty intense pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I know that was a lot that I just went over, and I don't have it all up here, but if you want like more detailed stuff, just talk to me afterwards. I'll get your email, and I'll send you more detailed stuff. Um, quick update on, um, on, the, on, on this uh, TCPA rule, because just last month, the FCC rolled out some, uh, a, new, uh, a new order that uh, further tightens the screws on the SMS marketing uh, industry, um, in particular on the auto dialer point that I was just referencing before. Uh, there was some ambiguity as to what would qualify as an auto dialer and what would, uh, therefore, what kinds of marketing messages would need to comply with the TCPA. Uh, and uh, so the FCC has basically said that virtually anything is an auto dialer. So if you're doing any kind of SMS marketing, you almost certainly are uh, using an auto dialer and therefore are almost certainly uh, subject to the TCPA. Um, the, uh, the other up, uh, significant update uh, from, uh, from the FCC's recent order, uh, and this is incredibly frustrating for me and for all of my clients, uh, because uh, it, as, is it, so this relates to reassigned numbers. So the, the frustrating thing here is, uh, even if we as you know, perfect, solid, compliant marketers go out and get the kinds of consent that we need, uh, prior express written consent, we follow all those ridiculous rules, it doesn't matter if, the, if that phone number has been reassigned to another consumer who has not consented, you're still violating the TCPA if you send them marketing messages. You get one for free. Uh, if you send them, oh, oops, I'm sorry, uh, you know, that, that, that first one's free, but how often are you going to know, how often is a consumer going to respond back to that and say, this, I'm not the same individual, therefore just take me, for, take me off your list. It might happen sometimes, but uh, it's not by any means a, 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 a good solution. And there's also no um, kind of uh, database that marketers can ping uh, to, to scrub their lists for reassigned numbers. So, I mean, it truly is just a cost of doing business in the SMS space. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm pretty, under pretty understanding of like, what the ecosystem is going on uh, with mobile and app, SMS, all that good stuff. It seems like it's fairly easy to manage it when it's all in house. Um, I have a question for you like, when, when we start giving out an offer to affiliates, mm -hmm. Okay. If the affiliate starts doing some like kind of shady stuff that might go against this that we would never do in house, yep. we're still on the hook for that, correct? What can we do to mitigate that? Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a huge problem. Uh, so, uh, and I, I actually do address that later, but I'll, I'll talk about it now. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, brands and advertisers, agencies, can, they, everybody can be vicariously liable for the activities of someone who, that you have uh, marketing on your behalf, um, and, and the the um, uh, the courts are becoming more and more uh, um, liberal, I suppose, in terms of ha interpreting who is uh, who has control uh, over over the marketing. So, it, it is a, a significant risk factor, right, for uh, uh, it, when you engage uh, third parties to do SMS marketing or any kind of marketing, frankly, but SMS in particular, on your behalf. You really, uh, uh, you really have to get very strong uh, contractual representations that they will comply with the TCPA. Specifically, you know, every every contract I work on in this area is going to have that specific representation. There's going to be a a, a a very specific indemnity that uh, that that backs up that uh, representation. Now, the downside is that uh, that those protections are only as good as the um, as the uh, as the party who's providing those protections and those indemnities, right? So. Uh, you know, if, if you're dealing with a real fly-by-night uh, marketing uh, party out there that's, uh, you know, um, pounding a, 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 a list that's, you know, ha ha that's old and doesn't have the necessary consents, that's, that's going to be uh, probably someone who's not going to be around for the long haul and is not going to be able to really back up their contractual representations and so forth. And so 
that the, the real risk mitigation there is uh, working with really vetted uh, uh, agencies and affiliates that are uh, that that have been around for a while that know that know the space. Um, and you know, I, I would say also get insurance, but in fact, uh, most uh, most insurance policies that I've reviewed specifically exclude TCPA liability. Um, so uh, it's kind of like you know, okay, you're you're being sued for violation of TCPA. Well, that's specifically excluded. You have no coverage, and uh, I can guarantee you that if you wanted to include that in your policy, it would be uh, at a hefty price. So it's just, uh, you know, it's it's the the best thing that you can really do is to vet your your uh, partners, uh, and and uh, you know, make sure make sure a lot of times pricing uh, will tell you a lot, uh, and. Uh, if it's a, a really cheap price, it's probably not the best product uh, or the best service. And so, um, but yeah, that's what these things are, are good for. These things being, you know, affiliate summit and, and uh, shows like this, where you can really talk to folks and get a sense of who's working uh, well and who's established and who's who's a, a reliable partner. Because in SMS, you definitely want to have a high, high, high comfort level with whoever you're uh, engaging with. Because the thing is also. Uh, there's just a cottage industry of plaintiffs' attorneys out there, um, and uh, you know it's an easy cause of action. It's an easy lawsuit, and and uh, you know um, they they you know there are numerous class actions in this area, um, and it's just a a, a, a goldmine really for uh, for plaintiffs' lawyers and class action lawyers. And so um, it's it's uh, it's not a trivial uh, thing. It's not like this vague thing that might maybe someday happen, it's happening every day with, with